Hi, and welcome to the lecture on Head and Spine Injuries, Chapter 26 in your text. After you complete this chapter and related coursework, you will understand how to manage trauma-related issues with the head and spine. You will learn how to recognize life threats associated with these injuries, as well as the need for immediate spine stabilization and potentially airway and breathing support. The curriculum includes detailed anatomy and physiology of the nervous system and the pathophysiology, assessment, and management of traumatic brain and spinal cord injuries. This chapter provides detail about traumatic brain injury, including initial mechanism of injury, primary or direct versus secondary or indirect injury. Transport considerations are discussed with a focus on potential for deterioration, and this chapter is skills intensive with detail on bandaging, traumatic airway control, manual inline stabilization, placement of a cervical collar, mobilization of the patient lying, sitting, or standing, and helmet removal. Regarding the National EMS Education Standard Competencies for Trauma, the EMT will apply a fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transportation based on assessment findings for an acutely injured patient. Specific for head, facial, neck, and spine, you will recognize and manage life threats and spine trauma. Regarding pathophysiology, assessment and management of penetrating neck trauma, laryngeotracheal injuries, spine trauma, facial fractures, skull fractures, foreign bodies of the eyes, and dental trauma. And these are all things we've talked about in some previous chapters. Specific to nervous system trauma, you will understand the pathophysiology assessment and management of traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury. The nervous system is a complex network of nerve cells that enables all parts of the body to function. It includes the brain and the spinal cord and several billion nerve fibers that carry information to and from all parts of the body. Because the nervous system is so vital, it is also well protected. The brain is protected by the skull and the spinal cord is protected by the bony spinal canal. Despite this protection, serious injuries can damage the nervous system. The nervous system is divided into two anatomic parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Here we have a picture of the brain and the spinal cord together, which is the central nervous system, and the peripheral nervous system is everything that comes off of the spinal column. The central nervous system includes the brain and spinal cord. The brain controls the body and is also the center of consciousness. It is divided into three major areas, the cerebrum, the cerebellum and the brainstem. And we've talked about this before when we talked about neurologic emergencies. Again, same picture we saw in the neurologic emergencies chapter. The cerebrum controls a wide variety of activities including most voluntary motor functions and conscious thought. It contains about 75 percent of the brain's total volume and it is divided into two hemispheres with four lobes. The cerebellum coordinates balance and body movements. And the brain stem controls most functions necessary for life, including the cardiac and respiratory systems and nerve function transmissions. It is the most primitive part of the CNS, but it is also the best protected part. The spinal cord is mostly made up of fibers that extend from the brain's nerve cells. It carries messages between the brain and the body via the gray and white matter of the spinal cord. Gray matter is composed of neural cell bodies and synapses, and white matter consists of fiber pathways. The cells of the brain and spinal cord are soft and easily injured. Therefore, the entire CNS is contained within a protective framework. The thick, bony structures of the skull and spinal canal withstand injury very well. The CNS is further protected by the meninges, three distinct layers of tissue that suspend the brain and the spinal cord within the skull and the spinal canal. The outer layer, the dura mater, is a tough fibrous layer that forms a sac to contain the CNS. The inner two layers, called the arachnoid and the pia mater, contain the blood vessels that nourish the brain and spinal cord. You can see a picture here showing the um, anatomy, which is the dura mater, the arachnoid membrane, and with the CSF and the pia mater. CSF is produced in a chamber inside the brain called the third ventricle. 
There is approximately 125 to 150 milliliters of CSF in the brain at one time. This is about the size of a 12 ounce soda can. CSF primarily acts as a shock absorber and when an injury does penetrate all the protective layers, clear watery CSF may leak from the nose and the ears of an open skull fracture. The peripheral nervous system. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves and they conduct impulses from the skin and other organs to the spinal cord. They conduct motor impulses from the spinal cord to the muscles and the spinal nerves serving the extremities are arranged in complex networks. And you can see these here. You have the brachial plexus networks up in the shoulders and you have the lumbo lumbosacral plexus in the hips. You have 12 pairs of cranial nerves and they transmit information directly to or from the brain. They perform special functions in the head and face including sight, smell, taste, hearing, and facial expressions. There are two major types of peripheral nerves called sensory nerves and they carry only one type of information from the body to the brain via the spinal cord. The other type is called motor nerves and there is one for each muscle and they carry information from the CNS to the muscles. You then have connecting nerves and they are found only in the brain and spinal cord. They connect the sensory and motor nerves with short fibers and they allow the exchange of simple messages. So ask yourself, how does the nervous system work? The nervous system controls virtually all of the body's activities including reflex activities, voluntary activities, and involuntary activities. We'll take a look at the animation. The connecting nerves in the spinal cord form a reflex arc. If a sensory nerve in this arc detects an irritating stimulus, it bypasses the brain and sends the message directly to the motor nerve. Here you can see an example of the reflex arc. So if you touch a hot object or you get close to a hot object, it doesn't have to go all the way up to your brain. It only goes to the uh, reflex arc in the spinal column and in the spinal cord and sensory back to motor doesn't have to travel all the way up to your brain to make you move. Voluntary activities are activities that we consciously perform in which sensory input determines the specific muscular activity. Involuntary activities are the actions that are not under conscious control, such as breathing. The somatic voluntary nervous system handles voluntary activities. The brain interprets the sensory information that it receives from the peripheral and cranial nerves and responds by sending signals to the voluntary muscles. The autonomic or involuntary nervous system handles the body functions that occur without conscious effort, controls the functions of many of the body's vital organs over which the brain has no voluntary control. It is divided into two parts, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. When we are confronted with a threatening situation, the sympathetic nervous system reacts to the stress with the fight or flight response. This response causes the pupils to dilate, smooth muscle in the lungs to dilate, heart rate to increase, and blood pressure to rise. During this time of stress, a hormone called epinephrine is released. The parasympathetic nervous system has the opposite effect on the body, causing blood vessels to dilate, slows the heart rate, and relaxes muscle sphincters. As the body attempts to maintain homeostasis, these two divisions of the autonomic nervous system tend to balance each other so that basic body functions remain stable and effective. The skeletal system. The skull is composed of two groups of bones, the cranium, which protects the brain, and the facial bones. The cranium is occupied by 80% brain tissue, 10% blood supply, and 10% CSF. The brain connects to the spinal cord through a large opening at the base of the skull called the foramen magnum. There are four major bones that make up the cranium, the occiput. The most posterior portion of the cranium is called the occiput. On each side of the cranium, the lateral portions are called the temporal, or temporal regions. Between the temporal regions and the occiput lie the parietal regions, and the forehead is called the frontal region. And the face is composed of 14 bones. The upper non-movable jaw bones are called the maxilla, the cheekbones are called the zygomas, and the mandible is the lower movable portion of the jaw. The orbit or eye socket is made up of two facial bones and the maxilla and the zygoma. The nose mostly consists of flexible cartilage.
The spinal column is the body's central supporting structure. It has 33 bones called vertebrae and it's divided into five sections. The cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal. And you can see those here. Cervical vertebrae are seven, thoracic are 12, which, which pair to our 12 ribs. The lumbar are five, the sacral are five infused, and the coccygeal are four infused. Injury to vertebrae can result in paralysis. And the front part of each vertebrae consists of a round, solid block of bone called the vertebral body. The back part forms the bony arch. The series of arches form a tunnel called the spinal canal, which encases and protects the cord. The vertebrae are connected by ligaments and separated by cushions called intervertebral discs. And the spinal column itself is almost entirely surrounded by muscle. A head injury is a traumatic insult to the head that may result in injury to soft tissue bony structures in the brain. Approximately 4 million people annually experience head injuries of varying, varying severity in the United States. 52,000 deaths occur annually as a result of severe head injury. Head injuries account for more than half of all traumatic deaths and fatal injuries invariably involve the brain. You should be alert to the fact that the patient may have sustained additional trauma like C-spine injuries, pelvic injuries, and chest injuries. There are two types of head injuries, closed head injuries and open head injuries. Closed head injuries are those in which the brain has been injured but there is no opening into the brain, and an open head injury is one in which the opening from the brain to the outside world exists. It is obvious skull deformity is a sign of an open head injury which is often caused by penetrating trauma and there may be bleeding and exposed brain tissue. Motor vehicle crashes are the most common MOI for head and spine injury. More than two-thirds of people involved in motor vehicle crashes experience a head trauma. Head injuries also occur commonly in victims of assault, when elderly people fall, during sports related incidents, and in a variety of incidents involving the younger population. Any head injury is potentially serious if it's not properly treated. This table, 26-1, gives you some general signs and symptoms of a head injury and you can use it as a study guide. Scalp lacerations can be minor or serious. Even small lacerations can quickly lead to significant blood loss. Occasionally, this blood loss may be severe enough to cause hypovolemic shock, particularly in children. And because these scalp lacerations are usually the result of direct blows to the head, they are often an indicator of deeper, more serious injuries. Skull fractures. Significant force applied to the head may cause a skull fracture. This skull fracture can be open or closed, depending on whether there is an overlying laceration to the scalp. Injuries from bullets or other penetrating weapons frequently result in skull fracture. Some of the signs of a fractured skull include that the patient's head appears to be deformed, there are visible cracks in the skull, there's ecchymosis or bruising that develops under the eyes, commonly referred to as raccoon eyes, or there's ecchymosis that develops behind one ear or the other over the mastoid process, and we call this battle sign. Here you have an example of, of raccoon's eyes and battle sign. Linear skull fractures account for approximately 80% of all fractured skulls. Radiographs or x-rays are often required to diagnose a linear skull fracture because there are often no physical signs like deformity. Compressed skull fractures result from high energy direct trauma to the head with a blunt object and the frontal and parietal bones of the skull are the most susceptible. Bony fragments may be driven into the brain, resulting in injury, and the patients often present with neurologic signs such as a loss of consciousness. Basilar skull fractures are associated with high energy trauma, but usually occur following diffuse impact to the head. These injuries generally result from extension of a linear fracture to the base of the skull and can be difficult to diagnose with radiography. Signs of a basilar skull fracture include CSF drainage from the ears, other signs include raccoon's eyes and battle signs. Open skull fractures of the cranial vault result when severe forces are applied to the head and are often associated with trauma to multiple body systems. Brain tissue may be exposed to the environment, which significantly increases risk of a bacterial infection, and there is a very high mortality rate from these types of injuries. Traumatic brain injuries, or TBI, are the most serious of all head injuries. 
The National Head Injury Foundation defines the TBI as a traumatic insult to the brain capable of producing physical, intellectual, emotional, social, and vocational changes. They're classified into two broad categories, primary or direct injury and secondary or indirect injury. A primary brain injury results instantaneously from impact to the head. Secondary brain injury increases the severity of a primary injury and may be caused by a swelling in the brain called cerebral edema, by intracranial hemorrhage or bleeding in the brain, by increased intracranial pressure, by cerebral ischemia, or by infection. Hypoxia and hypotension are the two most common causes of secondary brain injury. The brain can be injured direct by a, a penetrating object such as a bullet, knife, or other sharp object, or indirect as a result of external forces exerted on the skull. A coup contra coup injury can result from striking a windshield in a car crash. The initial impact injures the front part of the brain, the head falling back against the headrest then injures the rear part of the brain. Cerebral edema, swelling of the brain, may not develop until several hours following the initial injury. It is not uncommon for the patient with a head injury to have a convulsion or seizure. Intracranial pressure. Accumulations of blood within the skull or swelling of the brain can rapidly lead to an increase in ICP. Increased ICP squeezes the brain against bony prominences within the skull. This table, 26-2, gives you some levels of intracranial pressure. It talks about mild elevation, and the symptoms we'll see, moderate elevation that indicates involvement of the middle brain stem, and marked elevation, with, which indicates that the lower portion of the brain stem is now involved. And again, what the signs and symptoms are that we see. Other effects of cerebral edema and increased ICP may be increased systolic blood pressure, decreased pulse rate, and irregular respirations. And this is a triad we refer to as Cushing's triad or Cushing's reflex. Intracranial hemorrhage is bleeding inside the skull, which increases the ICP. It can occur between the skull and the dura mater, between, beneath the dura mater, but outside the brain, or within the tissue of the brain itself. The first one of these we're going to talk about is an epidural hematoma. An epidural hematoma is an accumulation of blood between the skull and the dura mater, nearly always the result of a blow to the head that produces a linear fracture of the thin temporal bone. Arterial bleeding into the epidural space will result in rapidly progressing symptoms, and often the patient loses consciousness immediately following the injury. This is often followed by a brief period of consciousness called the lucid interval, after which the patient lapses back into unconsciousness. Death will follow very rapidly without surgery to evacuate the hematoma. A subdural, on the, a subdural hematoma, on the other hand, is an accumulation of blood beneath the dura mater but outside the brain usually occurs after falls or injuries involving strong deceleration forces and it's more common than epidural hematomas and may or may not be associated with a skull fracture. A subdural hematoma is associated with venous bleeding so the signs typically develop more gradually than with an epidural hematoma. The patient often experiences a fluctuating level of consciousness or slurred speech. An intracerebral hematoma involves bleeding within the brain tissue itself. It can occur following a penetrating injury to the head or because of rapid deceleration forces. Many small, deep intracerebral hemorrhages are associated with other brain injuries, and intracerebral hematomas have a high mortality rate even if the hematoma is surgically evacuated. A subarachnoid hemorrhage is bleeding that occurs into the subarachnoid space where the CSF circulates. It results in bloody CSF and signs of meningeal irritation and common causes include trauma or rupture of an aneurysm. A sudden severe subarachnoid hematoma usually results in death. Concussions. A blow to the head or face may cause a concussion to the brain. They're also commonly known as mild TBIs. In general, it is a closed injury with a temporary loss or alteration of part or all of the brain's ability to function without demonstrable physical damage to the brain.
About 90% of patients who sustain a concussion do not experience loss of consciousness. A patient who does have a concussion may be confused or have amnesia. Occasionally, the patient may have retrograde amnesia, which means he or she can remember everything but the events leading up to the injury. Inability to remember events after the injury is called anterior grade, post-traumatic amnesia. Usually, a concussion only lasts a short time, and you should ask about symptoms of concussion in any patient who has had an injury to the head, and these include dizziness, weakness, visual changes, nausea, vomiting, ringing in the ears, slurred speech, inability to focus, lack of coordination, delay of motor function, inappropriate emotional response, temporary headache, or disorientation. Let's now watch this animation. So you can watch this, the little change in the brain here. You should assume that a patient with signs and symptoms of a concussion has a more serious injury until proven otherwise by CT scan, at a hospital, or by physician eval. Contusion. Like any other soft tissue in the body, the brain can sustain a contusion or bruise when the skull is struck. It is far more serious than a concussion. It involves physical injury to the brain tissue. It may produce long-lasting and even permanent damage, and a patient who has sustained a brain contusion may exhibit any or all of the signs of brain injury. Other brain injuries. Brain injuries can also arise from medical conditions such as blood clots and hemorrhages. Problems with the blood vessels, high blood pressure, or any number of other problems may cause spontaneous bleeding into the brain. And this can affect the patient's level of consciousness. We call this altered mental status. And the signs and symptoms of non-traumatic injuries are often the same as those of TBIs, except there's no history or mechanism or any evidence of external trauma. The cervical, thoracic, and lumbar portions of the spine can be injured in a variety of ways. Compression injuries can result from a fall, regardless of whether the patient landed on his or her feet, coccyx, or on the top of their head. Motor vehicle crashes or other types of trauma can overextend, flex, or rotate the spine. Any one of these unnatural motions, as well as excessive lateral bending, can result in fractures or neurologic deficit. When the spine is pulled along its length, this is called distraction and it can cause injury. Subluxation of the spine occurs when the vertebrae are no longer aligned. This type of injury pattern can occur with a hyperextension mechanism or can be caused by a fracture or dislocation. Some common findings include pain and tenderness on palpation of the region, and subluxation is a dangerous injury and can evolve into a full debilitating spinal cord injury. Patient assessment. You should always suspect a possible head or spine injury anytime you encounter one of the following mechanisms. Motor vehicle crashes, pedestrian motor vehicle collisions, falls, blunt trauma, penetrating trauma to the head, neck, back, or torso, motorcycle crashes, any type of rapid deceleration injury, hanging, diving accidents, or recreational accidents. The patient assessment steps are always the same. Scene size up, primary assessment, history taking, secondary assessment, and reassess. For scene size up, we need to evaluate every scene for hazards to your health and the health of your team or bystanders. Be prepared with an appropriate standard precaution before you approach the patient in a motor vehicle crash. Gloves, a mask, and eye protection should be the minimum standard precautions that you use. Call for ALS as soon as possible when you have a serious mechanism or complicated presentation is evident. When assessing a patient with a possible closed head injury, consider the mechanism. Did the patient fall? Was he or she in an automobile crash or the victim of an assault? Was there a deformity of the windshield or deformity to the helmet? Look for indicators of the MOI and consider how the MOI produced the injuries we expect. Primary assessment. We should focus on identifying and managing the life-threatening conditions. Form a general impression and ask about the chief complaint. If the patient is responsive, you may begin by asking some of the following questions. What happened? Where does it hurt? Does your neck or back hurt? Can you move your hands or feet? Did you hit your head? Confused or slurred speech, repetitive questioning, or amnesia in responsive patients is a good indication of a head injury.
Assume your patient has a head injury until your assessment proves otherwise. If the patient is found unresponsive, emergency responders, family members, or bystanders may have helpful information. An MOI that suggests a potential spine injury should lead you to provide complete spinal motion restriction. Assess airway and breathing. When a spinal injury is suspected, how you open and assess the airway is important. Begin by manually holding the patient's head still while you assess. Use a jaw thrust maneuver to open the airway. If it is ineffective, it is acceptable to use the head tilt chin lift. An oral airway or nasal airway may assist in maintenance of the airway. Vomiting may occur in the patient with a head injury and he may need to be log rolled to the side and the mouth swept of secretions. Apply a cervical spine immobilization device as soon as you have assessed the airway and breathing and provided necessary treatments. The best time to apply the cervical collar depends on the patient's injuries and the seriousness of his or her condition. The key to managing spinal injuries and airway and breathing problems is to move the patient as little as possible and as carefully as possible, maintaining spinal alignment throughout. Irregular breathing, such as Shane Stokes respirations, may result from increased pressure on the brain because of bleeding or swelling in the cranial vault. Oxygen, delivered at a rate of 15 liters a minute by a non-rebreather mask or via BVM, is always indicated for patients with head and spine injuries. Pulse oximetry values should be maintained above 90%. A pulse that is too slow in the setting of a head injury can indicate a serious condition. You should always assess airway and breathing prior to moving on to the assessment of circulation by checking the pulse. In, if the pulse is present and adequate, you can continue to evaluate your patient further. A single episode of hypoperfusion in a patient with a head injury can lead to significant brain damage and even death. Assess for signs and symptoms of shock, treat them appropriately, and control major bleeding. Make your transport decision. Most head injuries are considered mild and result in no or limited permanent disability. A smaller percentage of head injuries are considered moderate and the patient is left with some permanent disability. A still smaller percentage of head injuries are considered severe and many patients with a severe head injury die before reaching the hospital. Reduction of on-scene time, recognition of a critical patient, will increase the patient's chances for survival. You need to make several transport considerations with patients with head trauma. If they have an impaired airway, open head wounds, or abnormal vital signs, or those patients who do not respond to painful stimuli, may need to be rapidly extricated from a motor vehicle and transported. You need to provide the patient with a patent airway and high flow oxygen, as this is paramount to survival. There is probability of vomiting and seizures, so suction should be readily available, and remember to maintain spinal stabilization. The use of lights and sirens may actually increase your patient's level of distress, so this should be used cautiously, and patients who are conscious and aware of the inability to move their limbs need to be offered psychological support. Investigate the chief complaint. Obtain a medical history and be alert for injury-specific signs and symptoms as well as any pertinent negatives. Use OPQ-RST, as this may provide some background on isolated extremity injuries. Any information you receive will be valuable if the patient loses consciousness. If the patient is not responsive, attempt to obtain the history from other sources, such as friends, family members, medical alert jewelry, and cards and wallets. And gather as much sample history as you can while preparing for transport. Secondary Assessment Remember that the ability to walk, move the extremities, or feel sensation does not necessarily rule out a spinal injury. The absence of pain does not always indicate that spinal injury has not occurred. Instruct the patient to keep still and not move their head or neck. Perform a physical exam, which may be a systematic head-to-toe, a full-body scan, or a systematic assessment that focuses on a certain area or region of the body. Patients with moderate or severe head injuries should receive life-saving medical or surgical intervention at the hospital. Perform a full body scan using DCAP BTLS and examine the head, the chest, the abdomen, extremities, and back. Check for fusion, motor function, and sensation in all extremities prior to moving the patient. If the patient has a decreased level of consciousness, this is the most reliable sign of a head injury, and determine whether there is decreased movement and or numbness and tingling in the extremities. Look for blood or CSF leaking from the ears, nose, or mouth, and for bruising around the eyes and behind the ears. Evaluate the patient's pupils to see if they are equal and reactive to light. 
Do not probe open scalp lacerations with your gloved finger because this may push bone fragments into the brain. Head injury. Perform a neurologic exam using the Glasgow Coma Scale. Always use simple, easily understood terms when reporting level of consciousness. Again, table for Glasgow Coma Scale and you need to be intimately familiar with this. Spinal injuries. Inspect for DCAP BTLS. Check the extremities for circulation, motor, or sensory issues. If there is impairment, note the level. Pain or tenderness when you palpate the spine is a warning sign that a spinal injury could exist. Other signs and symptoms include an obvious deformity, numbness, weakness, or tingling in the extremities, and soft tissue injuries in the spinal region. Injuries to the cervical area can limit the ability of the diaphragm to function fully and minimize the ability of the chest wall to fully expand. Additional signs include abdominal excursion, an inability to maintain body temperature, priapism, and loss of bowel or bladder control. Assess vital signs. Significant head injuries may cause the pulse to slow and the blood pressure to rise. Respirations will become erratic with complications from both head and spine. Assess pupil size and reaction to light and use monitoring devices to monitor oxygenation and circulatory status as well as CO2 monitoring which is highly important in traumatic brain injury and blood pressure monitoring. Reassessment. Repeat your primary assessment. Reassess your vital signs and chief complaint and recheck patient interventions. These injuries can suddenly affect the respiratory, circulatory, and nervous systems and the patient condition should be reassessed at least every five minutes. Rapid deterioration of neurologic signs following head trauma is a sign of an expanding intracranial hematoma or rapidly progressing brain swelling. You must act quickly to evaluate and treat these patients. If CSF is present, cover the wound with sterile gauze to prevent further contamination, but do not bandage tightly. Hyperventilation should be used with caution and only when capnography is available. Your protocol should include the administration of high flow oxygen and the application of a cervical collar as part of, as part of spinal immobilization. Your documentation should include the history you were able to obtain at the scene, your findings during your assessment, treatment you provided, and how the patient responded. Patients who are seriously injured should have documented vital signs every five minutes. Patients who are more stable should have documented vital signs every 15. Remember that any type of head or brain injury that resulted from trauma, you may be called to testify. Emergency medical care of head injuries. There are three general principles to protect and maintain critical functions of the central nervous system. Number one, establish an adequate airway. If necessary, begin and maintain ventilation and always provide high flow oxygen. Control bleeding, provide adequate circulation to maintain cerebral perfusion. Begin CPR if necessary and be sure to follow standard precautions. Assess the patient's baseline level of consciousness and continuously monitor it. Manage the airway. The most important step is establishing an adequate airway. If the patient has an airway obstruction, perform the jaw thrust and once the airway is open, maintain the head and C-spine in a neutral inline position. Remove foreign body secretions or vomitus from the airway. Make sure a suction unit is available. Once you have cleared the airway, check ventilation. Give high flow oxygen to any patient with suspected head injury, particularly anyone who is having trouble breathing. If the heart is not beating, provide airway maintenance, ventilation, and oxygen accomplish nothing. You must begin CPR if the patient's in cardiac arrest. Active blood loss aggravates hypoxia because it reduces the available number of oxygen-carrying red blood cells. Bleeding inside the skull may cause ICP to rise to life-threatening levels. You can almost always control bleeding from a scalp laceration by applying direct pressure over the wound. If you suspect a skull pr fracture, do not apply excessive pressure pressure to the wound, and if the dressing becomes soaked, do not remove it. Instead, place a second dressing over the first. Cushing's triad or Cushing's reflex. Increased blood pressure or hypertension, decreased heart rate or bradycardia, and irregular respirations like Shane Stokes, central neurogenic hyperventilation, or BIOTS 
or part of what we consider the triad. If this process is allowed to continue, it is a fatal injury, and your patient may need to receive hyperventilation via positive pressure ventilations, but only if you can adequately monitor their CO2 levels. Emergency care for spinal injuries. Remember always to follow your standard precautions. Maintain the patient's airway while keeping the spine in the proper position, assess respirations, and give supplemental oxygen. Manage the airway. Perform the jaw thrust. Do not use the head tilt chin lift maneuver because it extends the neck and may further damage the cervical spine. After you open the airway, consider inserting an oral pharyngeal airway. Have a suctioning unit readily available and provide high flow oxygen. Stabilization of the cervical spine should be your first priority and stabilization of the airway. Immobilize the head and trunk so that bone fragments do not cause further damage. Follow the steps in skill drill 26-1 and remember even small movements can cause significant injury to the spinal cord. Assess the pulse, motor function, and sensation in all extremities. Assess the, assess the cervical spine area and neck and never force the head into a neutral inline position. Do not move the head any further if the patient reports any of the following symptoms. Muscle spasms in the neck, substantial increased pain, numbness, tingling, or weakness in the arms and legs, or a comprised airway, compromised airway or ventilations. Preparing your patient for transport. Patients who are supine need to be secured to a long spine board. The ideal way to move a patient from the ground to a backboard is the four-person log roll. You may also slide the patient onto a backboard or use a scoop stretcher. To immobilize a patient to a backboard, follow the steps in skill drill 26-2. Patients suspected of having a spinal cord injury are best immobilized by securing them to a long backboard. The best way to do this is with the log roll technique. Use appropriate body substance isolation precautions prior to beginning care. Have your partner take control of the patient's head and neck, holding neutral alignment until a stabilization device is in place. Check the distal circulation, sensation, and motor function in all four of the patient's extremities. Okay. You feel me touching your feet? You feel that? Yeah. Push down on my hands. Ensure that the head and neck are maintained in the neutral position until completely stabilized and with a rigid extrication collar and mechanical cervical motion restriction. Choose the correct size rigid extrication collar for the patient using an appropriate sizing method. Apply the extrication collar without allowing flexion or extension of the patient's neck. Position the long backboard beside the patient. With the aid of one or two additional rescuers or bystanders, log roll the patient. The log roll should be performed by grasping the patient's chest and pelvis, not the shoulder blades. You let me know if any of this hurts. Perform a quick and thorough exam of the patient's back and spine. Don't hear it all? No. No deformity. 
with small controlled movements, slide or lift the patient into proper position on the board. The patient should be positioned by sliding up or down along the axis of the body using a pulling motion. Place padding in any voids found between the torso and the spine to reduce the possibility of spinal movement. Secure the patient to the board with a minimum of three straps. The first strap needs to be over the patient's chest, the second over the pelvis, and the third over the thighs. Secure the head to the board using the cervical immobilization device, towel rolls, or other soft padding that restricts lateral movement. When stabilization is complete, the head and neck must be in a neutral, inline position. Place a pillow under the patient's knees to maintain a slightly bent position. This will place the back in the correct anatomical position. Ensure that the patient's legs are secured to the backboard. Check the distal circulation, sensation, and motor function in all four of the patient's extremities. Feel me touching? Give me a squeeze. Okay. Feel me touching your feet? Press down on the gas pedal. Pull up. You are now ready to carry the patient. For patients who are sitting, if there is time, use a short backboard or other short spinal extrication device to immobilize the cervical and thoracic spine. Then secure the short board to the long board. The exceptions to this rule are situations where you do not have time to first secure the patient to the short board, including the following. You or your patient are in danger. You need to gain immediate access to other patients. The patient's injuries justify urgent removal. In all other cases, follow the steps in Skill Drill 26-3 to immobilize a sitting patient. Improper handling and treatment of a spinal cord injury may result in paralysis. It is therefore important to exercise extreme caution when handling a patient with a spinal cord injury. If the patient is seated and you suspect a spinal cord injury, Follow these procedures. Have your partner take control of the seated patient's head and neck, holding neutral alignment until a stabilization device is in place. Choose the correct sized, rigid extrication collar for the patient using an appropriate sizing method. Apply the extrication collar without allowing flexion or extension of the patient's neck. Ensure that the patient's head and neck are maintained in the neutral position until completely stabilized with an extrication collar and mechanical cervical motion restriction. Check the distal circulation, sensation, and motor function in all four of the patient's extremities. Position the short device behind the patient without compromising the integrity of the cervical spine. Begin by having your partner apply manual traction to the patient's head and neck 
while moving the patient's torso forward. Usually, a count of three, given by the responder controlling the head, is used to coordinate the movement of the responders as a unit. Slide the immobilization device behind the patient and manipulate it into position. While working the immobilization device behind the patient, make sure the device does not get caught on the patient's clothing or the car seat. Bring the side panels up into the axilla as high as possible without impeding circulation through the axillary artery. Instruct your partner to move the patient back into position against the back of the seat. Begin strapping the short device to the patient's chest. Attach all three straps smoothly and snugly. Be sure to adjust each strap without twisting the device. The chest strap should be snug, but not compromise the patient's respiratory effort. Attach both ischial straps. These straps may be crossed or secured directly. secure the patient's head to the device, ensure that the splint is firmly secured to the torso. The top strap should be securely tightened without impeding the patient's ventilatory effort. Adjust the device as necessary to ensure proper fit. It may be necessary to place a folded neck pillow behind the patient's head to achieve neutral alignment with the back of the board. When alignment is completed, the patient's face should be positioned, looking directly forward in a natural anatomic position. Be sure that the patient's neck is not flexed or hyperextended. alignment of the patient's neck must be maintained by your partner throughout this step. Once the step is complete, tighten the chest strap. The final position of the head and neck must be neutral and in line. With the patient secured to the short device, move the patient to a long backboard. Check the distal circulation, sensation, and motor function in all four of the patient's extremities.
outstanding patients should be immobilized to the long board before proceeding with your assessment. This does require three EMTs, and to immobilize a standing patient, you're going to follow the steps in Skill Drill 26-4. Immobilization devices. During assessment, pain is in the spine may be missed because of shock or because the patient's attention is directed to more painful injuries. Because any manipulation of the unstable cervical spine may cause permanent damage to the spinal cord, you must assume the presence of spinal injury in all patients who have sustained a head injury. Use manual inline immobilization or a cervical collar in a long backboard. Cervical collars should provide preliminary partial support. They should be applied to every patient who has a possible spine injury based on mechanism, history, or signs and symptoms. To be effective, a rigid cervical collar must be the correct size for the patient. To apply the cervical collar, follow the steps in Skill Drill 26-5. Have your partner take control of the seated patient's head and neck, holding neutral alignment until a stabilization device is in place. Choose the correct sized rigid extrication collar for the patient using an appropriate sizing method. Apply the extrication collar without allowing flexion or extension of the patient's neck. Ensure that the patient's head and neck are maintained in the neutral position until completely stabilized with an extrication collar and mechanical cervical motion restriction. Check the distal circulation, sensation, and motor function in all four of the patient's extremities. The most common short backboards are the vest type device and the rigid shortboard. These devices are designed to stabilize and mobilize the head, neck, and torso. Used to immobilize non-critical patients who are found in a sitting position and have possible spinal injuries, and you'll learn how to use these in class. Long backboard devices provide full body spinal immobilization and motion restriction and immobilization to the head, neck, torso, pelvis, and extremities. They are used to immobilize patients who are found in any position, sometimes in conjunction with shortboards. Helmet removal. As you plan your care of a patient wearing a helmet, ask yourself the following questions. Is the patient's airway clear? Is the patient breathing adequately? Can I maintain the airway and assist ventilations if the helmet remains in place? Can the face guard be easily removed to allow access to the airway without removing the helmet? How well does the helmet fit? Can the patient move within the helmet? Can the spine be immobilized in a neutral position? with the helmet on. A helmet that fits well prevents the patient's head from moving and should be left on. Provided there are no impending airway or breathing problems, it does not interfere with assessment and treatment of airway or ventilation problems, you can properly immobilize the spine where there is any chance that removing it will further injure the patient. However, you should remove the helmet if it makes assessing or managing airway problems difficult and removal of a face guard to improve airway access is not possible. It prevents you from properly immobilizing the spine. It allows excessive head movement or the patient is in cardiac arrest. The preferred method for helmet removal involves the following. It's always a two-person job. The technique for helmet removal depends on the actual type of helmet your patient is wearing. You and your partner do not move at the same time and you should first consult with medical control about your decision to remove a helmet. You'll follow the steps in Skill Drill 26-6 for helmet removal. An alternate method, and the advantage to this, is that it allows the helmet to be removed with the application of less force and it reduces the likelihood of motion occurring in the neck. The disadvantage is that it is slightly more time consuming. The steps to the alternate method are to remove the chin strap, remove the face mask, pop the jaw pads out of place with a tongue depressor, place your fingers inside the helmet during removal of the helmet. The person at the side of the patient controls the head by holding the jaw with one hand and the occiput with the other. Insert padding behind the occiput to prevent extension of the neck. The person at the side of the patient's chest is responsible for making sure that the head and neck do not move during helmet removal. Remember, small children may require additional padding to maintain inline neutral position. In summary, 
The human nervous system can be divided into two parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system consists of a network of nerve fibers like cables that transmit information to and from the body's organs and to and from the brain. The CNS is well protected by bony structures. The brain is protected by the skull and the spinal cord is protected by the bones of the spinal column. The CNS is also covered and protected by three layers of tissue called the meninges. The layers are called the dura mater, the arachnoid membrane, and the pia mater. A head injury is a traumatic injury to the head that may result in injury to soft tissue, bony structures, or the brain. A traumatic brain injury is a severe head injury that can be a life threat or leave the patient with life-altering injuries. The cervical, thoracic, and lumbar portions of the spinal column can be injured through compression, such as in a fall, unnatural motions, such as overextension from trauma, distraction from su things such as a hanging or a combination of mechanisms. Motor vehicle crashes, direct blows, falls from heights, assault, and sports injuries are common causes of spinal cord injury. A patient who has experienced any of these events may also have sustained a head injury. Treat the patient with a head injury according to the three general principles that are designed to protect and maintain the critical functions of the central nervous system. Establish an adequate airway, control bleeding, and reassess the patient's baseline level of consciousness. Treat the patient with a spinal injury by maintaining the airway while keeping the spine in proper alignment, assess respirations, and give supplemental oxygen. If ABCs or other problems demand rapid transport, rapid stabilization of the spine, and quick loading into the ambulance may be indicated. Reduction of on-scene time increases the critical patient's chances for survival or a reduction in the amount of irreversible damage. Thanks, and as I said, if you have questions, please bring them to class to talk with your instructor.